on the chat. So today I want to talk about hard clustering. And this is our first example for an unsupervised machine learning method. Unsupervised in the sense that we don't need a supervisor or a teacher that labels data points. So far, we have mostly heard about machine learning methods that needed as their fuel, so to say, as their input, labeled data points. For example, images for which we know if the image shows a cat or a dog. So we need, we need a lot of labeled data for such methods. Today, we talk about uh, machine learning methods, in particular clustering methods, which don't need any uh, labeled data points. That's why they're called unsupervised learning methods. So what I want to teach you today is uh, the basic idea of hard clustering, how to represent clusters in particular. Then I will show you one of the, maybe the most popular method for hard clustering, which is called k-means. We will see that k-means is again, uh, an optimization method. So similar to all the machine learning methods we have heard before, also k-means turns out to solve or minimize an error or an empirical risk function. But this empirical risk function looks a bit different than this average loss that we uh, used for regression or classification methods. And uh, we will also see that uh, the number of clusters needs to be given for uh, k-means. So k-means needs the number of, cl of clusters to be specified. Yeah, please everybody turn off the microphone. I will again try to mute all of you. So, but first things first, what are three main components of machine learning? So I will wait till I get at least 10 answers. Yes, now it's coming in. Data model loss, very good. So first component, maybe the most important comment, uh, component, data. Uh, data as a collection or a set of individual data points. So here we have, for example, some data points which characterize or represent days in Finland. And we have some properties of data points which we call features, like the minimum daytime temperature, and the maximum daytime temperature. And in clustering, we, we don't uh, need labels. So we, we look at data points only as uh, sets of features. So uh, here, uh, I could use the maximum daytime temperature as a label, which I did before but not in this lecture. So in, in today's lecture, I consider the maximum daytime temperature just a property. So on the same level as uh, the minimum daytime temperature. These are just two properties, two features that characterize a data point. And in clustering methods, uh, as you might guess, we would like to find clusters. So what is a cluster? Uh, if you look up uh, Wikipedia, for example, you get different definitions for the term cluster, a cluster of islands, uh, a leukemia cluster. Now in the, in the media, we hear a lot about COVID-19 clusters, but in this course or in this lecture, we use a very precise definition, uh, which is based on an, on an informal definition shown here. So a cluster corresponds to a subset of data points that are in some sense homo homogeneous or similar to each other. And this is only informal because at some point we need to make precise what we mean by homogeneous and similar. So there are different uh, meanings of these terms and the different meanings or different definitions for what we consider as homogeneous or what we consider as similar data points end up in different clustering methods. So let me show here again this data set and then I could say, well, there are two clusters. I could define two clusters because there's one cluster where data points are aligned a straight line. And there's another cluster where data points are also al aligned a straight line, but there's a different straight line than this here. So homogeneous here means that data points are aligned on a straight line. 
this could be one definition of homogeneous. And then I, I try to find clusters that consist of data points that are all lined up nicely on a straight line. What could I do then with, with such a data set? Did, did we already use machine learning methods that tried to fit straight lines to data points? What type of methods did we hear about that aimed at finding a straight line that fits nicely through a given data set? Linear regression, yes. So uh, this here shows that we could do linear regression on separately on these two clusters because there is a linear regression uh, possible with a different uh, hypothesis. So the straight lines could be interpreted as hypothesis, a linear hypothesis. And here for this other cluster, we have a different hypothesis. And this already points out one possible application of clustering to pre-select or to partition the data set into subsets or clusters such that you can apply individual uh, machine learning methods on the individual clusters. So we apply linear regression on this data set and another instance of linear regression on that data set. And the result might be better than using the whole data set for one single linear regression method, because uh, then you have to interpolate between these two different straight lines. So clustering could be used to divide uh, the data set into smaller subsets or clusters, where on each cluster we can fit a, a, a linear hypothesis, for example. Yeah, so this brings me to a, a short overview of different cluster applications, clustering applications. Uh, the first one is outlier detection. So consider uh, data points being images. So each image here, which is a, a aerial photograph of Helsinki city area, uh, you can download them from the internet. They are freely available. Uh, post here the website, carta.tel.fi. <coughs> Excuse me. And there you can download these images of the Helsinki city area. And then we would like to know, are there certain road markings? So these images are taken off road markings and we would like to find or the city planners or city managers of Helsinki or the traffic department, they would like to know, are there uh, pedestrian crossings which are already very blurry or which are not uh, visible that well anymore. So the paint needs a renewal. And what we could do is, well, we could try to cluster the data set. So what I did to get this scatter plot was I computed or I determined for each data point two features. And we will hear about feature learning methods in the next round, in the next week's lecture. So there are ways to take such an image, I guess this was 100 by 100 pixels, and compute only two numbers, two features uh, to characterize the data point. And so if we characterize a data point by two numbers, we can use those two numbers as coordinates in a two-dimensional plane and obtain a scatter plot. And then we can use clustering methods to see if there are two groups. So if there's a big group, a bulk group of images, remember each data point, each blob here corresponds to one uh, road marking image. And we find one cluster, one big cluster of regular road image, uh, road, uh, road marking images and another group which is looks different. So this other group consists of data points which do not fit to the other data points that well. And when we look at them, so if we look back at the, the image that corresponds to these data points, we find that these are road markings which are not that uh, in that good shape or there is a shade. So there's a different light condition. So instead of going over all these images or this uh, aerial photographs manually by some city planner, the city planner uses uh, a clustering method to spot the kind of uh, suspicious uh, road marking images and then looks careful at these road marking images and then might send some team of road maintenance workers there. Okay, so one application is outlier. Uh, one application of clustering methods is the detection of outliers or abnormal data points. Another application is image segmentation. And here we use one image as a data set. 
So before one image was a data point, but here one image is a whole data set. And this data set consists of smaller data points and the data points are patches. So we cut this image into rectangular or square patches and each of these patches is a data point. And then we would like to see, can we group these patches into two groups? And hopefully one group is the foreground and the other group is the background. So what we do again, for each image patch, for each data point, we compute uh, three features in this case using a feature learning method, which is called PCA. So for each patch we compute, uh, oh no, uh, no, uh, let me correct myself. So we didn't use any elaborate feature learning method. We just computed the average red component, the average green component and the average blue component of each image. And patch, so each image patch is then characterized by three numbers, the average red level, green level and blue level. And then we again uh, use the clustering method. And what we got is this. So the clustering method uh, partitioned all the image patches into two groups or two clusters. And these two clusters are highlighted here by one red uh, with a red tone and the other one with a green tone. And it, it seems that the clustering method which was actually k-means, which I will explain today, found the foreground or uh, close, closely resembled the foreground and background of the image. Uh, and the third application I would like to mention is pre-processing, which I already touched briefly. So clustering can often be used as a pre-processing to clean the data or to sort the data, to, to divide the data set into smaller subsets or clusters where each cluster has data points which can be fit, for example, using linear regression. So again, if you look at this whole data set, then this entire data set can typically not be well fit using a single straight line. So this should be a straight line. Uh, but if you look at the separate uh, subsets here, they can be almost perfectly be fit using a straight line. So linear regression, doing separate linear regression on each of the clusters will be way more accurate than doing one single linear regression on the whole data set. So that's also a main application domain for clustering as a pre-processing step for some overall machine learning problem like a prediction or a regression or classification problem. Okay, are there any questions up to this point? So today I want to talk about a specific flavor of clustering. There are many different flavors of clustering called hard clustering and soft clustering. Today we talk about hard clustering and in the next lecture on Wednesday we will talk about soft clustering. So in hard clustering, which is maybe the most basic or most simple form of clustering, we assign each data point or we assume that each data point belongs to some, to some uh, or to one out of k clusters. So each data point here is characterized by features in features and some label, which we denote by Y. And this label is interpreted as a cluster index of the ith data point. So each label is a number one, either one or two up to K. K different, we have K different clusters and each data point belongs to one and exactly one cluster. So the, the data points that belong to cluster one are all data points whose label or cluster index is equal to one. Okay. And hard clustering methods are method, machine learning methods that try to predict the cluster index of each data point based only on the features of the data points. So these hard clustering methods, they do not require the knowledge of the true cluster index of any data point. So the input to a hard clustering method is just a set of feature vectors. So M feature vectors for M data points. And the output of a hard clustering method is uh, 
a predicted cluster assignment for each data point. So the cluster index for the first data point is y hat one up to the cluster index for the last data point is y hat m. That's a hard clustering method. It reads in the feature vectors of all data points. And just by looking at the intrinsic structure or geometry of these feature vectors, of this bunch of feature vectors, it tries to come up with a good uh, prediction for the cluster assignments. And we will focus now on one, maybe the most popular hard clustering method, which is called k-means. And the name already hints at uh, the, the main characteristic of k-means, which is uh, to represent the cluster by a mean. So a cluster is represented by some mean vector. And this mean vector has the same length as the feature vectors. We could think of the cluster mean as a, as a prototype feature vector that characterizes all the feature vectors assigned to cluster one. And cluster mean two is the, a prototype feature vector that characterizes all the data points in cluster two. There's now one question, will the algorithm cluster into as many clusters as there were features as you had M in both or they are different M. So the number of clusters is given. So K, the K here in K means, this letter K means the number of clusters. So we can run K means uh, with K equal to then we get two clusters, or we can run k means with k equal 10, then we get 10 clusters. So k is an input parameter. And this k might be different than, uh, than the number of features. So we can use uh, k means uh, for feature vectors with an arbitrary length. So these feature vectors uh, here uh, are vectors of length n, and n is arbitrary. So this can be any number. N can be five, or I could use data points characterized by uh, one million features if we look at images. So N can be arbitrary, and this is typically much larger than K, but it can also be smaller than K. So there's no, this uh, number of features and number of clusters is per se not coupled. So there's no, you can specify a certain number of features, uh, you can specify a certain number of clusters and you can use uh, arbitrary number of features for data points. Okay. So the key idea of k-means is to represent the cluster, each cluster by some cluster mean vector. Think of the cluster mean as a prototype feature vector for all the data points in that cluster. So the question then is, of course, how does k-means know what is a good cluster assignment? So how, how should k-means choose the cluster assignments? For example, which data points should be added to cluster one? with uh, which has the uh, representative or cluster mean M1. And then a natural idea or the key idea of, of k-means is then to try to minimize the cluster spread. So try to minimize the average squared Euclidean distance between the points, data points in a cluster and the, uh, the cluster mean. So. We have here, let's say this would be the data point with feature vector x2. So let's say the second data point is currently assigned to cluster C1 and the cluster C1 has, or the first cluster has currently the cluster mean M1. So then we have here uh, a distance, a certain distance. We compute the difference between those two vectors and we can measure the size of this difference or the distance by using the Euclidean norm. 
And we measure then the cluster spread by averaging the square of this Euclidean norm. So this is the squared Euclidean norm. And we sum these squared Euclidean norms up for all data points that are currently in cluster one and divide by the number of data points in cluster one. So this is the, the average squared Euclidean distance of the data points in cluster one. And we define this, <clears throat> we define this as the uh, cluster spread. Uh, yeah, so there are two questions here. Why squared? Uh, this is mainly a convention. We could define it uh, also only using the, <clears throat> the Euclidean norm without the square, but then this would not be k-means. So k-means, uh, this very popular clustering algorithm is based on using the squared Euclidean distance. Uh, then another question, what are the most significant differences between hard clustering and classification? Uh, well, the most important difference is that uh, hard clustering method only needs feature vectors as input. Uh, a classification method like logistic regression or decision trees uh, needs uh, also uh, the label values for the training data points. In clustering here, we don't need any labels. Okay, let me now move on. I will then answer all remaining questions uh, later in a few minutes. So now we have defined or we have kind of set up uh, a, a formalism to represent clusters. So we represent the cluster by a cluster mean vector. Uh, and then we have uh, defined the cluster spread as a measure for the quality of a cluster. So the, the cluster spread should, we would like, or k-means prefers clusters which have a small cluster spread. And there are now two uh, kind of tuning knobs we have to make the cluster spread small. Uh, the first knob is to, uh, to choose the cluster means in a, in a, in a uh, favorable way. And this will be then known as the cluster, uh, the mean cluster mean update step in k-means. So for a given set of data points that belong to a cluster, the best choice for the mean vector is the average of all feature vectors. Okay. So for a given cluster assignments, the cluster means, the best cluster means to minimize the cluster spread are, and this is somewhat in, intuitively clear, should be the average of all the feature vectors in a cluster. Okay. Uh, but then if you, if you say the cluster means a given, so let's now look at this data set here and this clustering where the cluster means are given you can also approach the minimizing the clustering error, which is the, the average of all cluster spreads. So we have defined the cluster spread for a single cluster as the average squared Euclidean distance between the points in the cluster and the cluster mean. And then it's natural to average all the individual cluster spreads. And when you average all the individual cluster spreads, you obtain the clustering error, which characterizes the whole clustering. So all clusters and not only one cluster. And K means aims at making this clustering error small and also via making the cl individual cluster spreads small. So one way to make them small is to choose the cluster means uh, in a clever way, like as the average of all data points in the cluster. But then you can also influence the clustering error by changing the, the data points that you assign to a certain cluster. So you can also say you can make the clustering error smaller if you assign data points to the nearest cluster mean. And this is called the cluster assignment update step. So let's now uh, repeat again. So for given cluster means, so I give you a set of prototype feature vectors, which we call cluster means. So let's say I give you these two cluster means. Then you can minimize the clustering error by assigning each data point to the cluster with nearest cluster mean. 
On the other hand, oh, this is illustrated here. So I give you two cluster means, and then I assign all data points that are nearer to cluster mean one to cluster one. So on this left side, so this here, this here, uh, this straight line divides the whole space into two half spaces. And in this half space, all data points are nearer to cluster mean two than to cluster mean one. And in this half space here, all data points in this half space are nearer to cluster mean one than to cluster mean two. So then it's natural to update the cluster assignments such that they all belong to cluster one. And these data points here belong to cluster two. Okay. And this is called cluster assignment update. But now that I have changed the cluster assignment, what do I do with the cluster means? And indeed, for given cluster assignments, I can minimize the clustering error by using as cluster means the average of all data points that are currently assigned to a class to the corresponding cluster. So the Cth cluster, where C goes from one till k, one till k. This is a cluster index. The cluster mean for the seeth cluster should be, in order to minimize the clustering error, should be chosen as the average of all feature vectors which are currently assigned to this cluster. So all data points whose predicted cluster assignment is equal to C. These, all these data points make up the current cluster C. C. <laughs> That's a funny notation. Okay. Uh, but then, now that I update the cluster means, so I update cluster mean one to be the average of all feature vectors in this cluster, and then I update cluster two to be the average of all these data points. Now the cluster means change, and I have to start again by, up, by updating the cluster assignments because now I have new cluster means. Then I change again the cluster assignments, but once the cluster assignments move, then I need to again update the cluster means. So this is some sort of a, 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 a chicken egg problem. What was first, the chicken or the egg? And how can we resolve this, such a, a, rec a recursion or recursive problem? Does anyone have an idea how to re resolve this recursion? Well, the idea of Cayman's is simple. Just repeat it. Just alternative, alternatively, or it's called alternating minimization. You start with some guess for the cluster means or initial cluster means. You update the cluster assignments. Once you have the cluster assignments, you update the cluster means and so on and so forth. So Cayman's is just an iter iteration or iterative algorithm that repeats uh, cluster assignment update and a cluster means update. And it repeats for a certain number of iterations. Uh, yeah, so that's k-means. We have arrived at the first clustering algorithm in our course, k-means. So it takes as input the number of clusters. So this is important. k, the number of clusters, must be specified as input, as an input parameter. k-means does not determine a good choice for k or the optimal choice for k. This is something we need to specify as an input parameter. Then k-means also needs as an input an initial choice for the cluster means. So we must start somewhere. We must start this iteration here uh, with some first guess for the cluster means, like here. I have here just drawn here cluster mean one first guess and cluster mean two here is the first guess. And then we start iterating and we update the cluster means in the course of the iterations. Okay. Uh, yeah, and the, the cluster shape, just to give you an intuition, uh, the class, typical cluster shape of k-means looks like this. So k-means looks always to group the, the data points into balls, 
into isotropic balls. Uh, so the clusters you get from k-means will always resemble such balls, such Euclidean balls. And there are, there are applications where you don't want such clustering. Uh, for example, if you remember, when we wanted to find outliers, uh, this clustering could not have been obtained by k-means because in this clustering, we want to have one cluster which somehow corresponds to a ball, so this bulk, but the second cluster here, uh, the second cluster, let me change the color, would be somehow in a ring around this other cluster. So the second cluster would be something like this here. And k-means cannot produce such ring-shaped clusters. k-means can only produce balls as clusters, like this ball in the middle. But the second, the second cluster, this ring-shaped cluster, there's no way we can get something like this with k-means. So this tells you that this outlier detection I didn't do with k-means, but with some other algorithm, which I will talk about in the next lectures. Okay. Uh, yeah, so now we have presented k-means. Before we talk more about its properties, let me answer the, the questions on the chat. Uh, can we do this many times? Can we run k-means many times to minimize the impact of the initial random clusters? Yes, so we'll talk about this in a second. Uh, why do we do clustering? Uh, I have mentioned some applications before. For example, we want to find outliers uh, and clustering might be the only thing we can do if we don't have labeled data. So we might want to do clustering because we don't have any labels for data points to do, to do classification, but we still would like to see if the data set decomposes into a few co coherent subgroups or clusters. So clustering is also a, a, a powerful tool for, it's called explorative data analysis. You just want to look at the data set somehow. And one way to look at data is try to find clusters. So are there tight, tight or, or very dense subsets of data points in a certain uh, feature space? It depends also on how you choose the features. Uh, another question. How does the algorithm choose the cluster for a data point if distance is identical to two different means? Very good point. I have resolved this issue in algorithm nine of the course book, but for simplicity in this lecture and also for the quiz, you can assume that this doesn't happen. If this happens, you must somehow break the tie. So if, if you have a, a data point that is on the same distance to several cluster means, you must assign it, you must define somehow a rule, for example, take the, assign it to the cluster mean with the smallest index, but this is purely arbitrary in the end. You just need some type breaking strategy, but this is not relevant for what I want to talk about today. You can read more about this in the course book. Uh, okay, so this clustering could never have been obtained by k-means. No way to do this with k-means. So there was also some questions on the chat uh, related to the question of how many iterations do we need to run k-means or when do we know it's a, now a good time to stop the iterations? Well, one way to find such a stopping criterion is by evaluating the, cluster, uh, the clustering error as the iterations progress. So consider you start with some cluster means and then do a cluster assignment update step. And then you continue one further iteration of k-means, so you get a new cluster means and a new cluster assignments. And then you can show that k-means never increases the clustering error. So the clusterings that are produced at the new iteration have never a higher clustering error than the previous clustering in the previous iteration. So uh, k-means is a kind of an descent method. So k-means in every iteration reduces the clustering error up to some point when the clustering error doesn't change anymore. And this, for example, can be used as a stopping criterion. So you can stop iterating uh, k-means as soon as the new clustering in the next iteration didn't give a smaller clustering error. Or alternatively, you can stop the iteration if the cluster assignments didn't change over the course of one iteration. Uh, 
because if the clustering errors, uh, if the cluster assignments didn't change. So in each iteration, you get a new cluster assignment. And if this cluster assignment that you get here in step one is the same as in the previous iteration, then you can easily show that also the cluster means will be the same as in the previous iteration and so on and so forth. So as soon as the cluster assignments don't change, there will be no progress anymore. So as soon as the cluster assignments stay the same, you know k-means has converged. Okay. Uh, yeah, one important property of k-means or one of the challenges of using k-means is that it's uh, not guaranteed to find an optimal clustering. So I have illustrated here, so this is only a cartoon because the horizontal axis here represents uh, discrete cluster assignments, which cannot be represented on a continuous axis like this, but it's just a cartoon. It shows you what, what k-means does, it, it changes or it iterates, it tries to improve this location on the horizontal axis by changing, by tuning or updating the cluster means and the cluster assignments. And it tries to, to update in, in a way that make the clustering error smaller and smaller. So once, let's say you start here with the initial cluster means, what k-means does is it finds a better one. This is the new clustering in the next iteration, then another a better one, then another a better one, and it only goes down. So what we know about k-means is it will never go uphill. However, uh, the problem is that this function here, this clustering error is highly non-convex and even non-differentiable because this cluster assignments are discrete variables and you cannot easily define a gradient with respect to discrete variables. So it might happen that if you choose a bad initialization, so if you initialize here, if you use initial cluster means such that you're here, you might up in a local minimum whose clustering error might be three instead of you could get a clustering error of one. So this would be the, cl the optimal clustering delivered by some optimal clustering method. But k-means is not a cluster, an optimal clustering method, unfortunately. So the initialization is crucial. Remember, k-means requires as its input the initial cluster means. And the performance or the, the quality of the resulting clustering that is delivered by k-means depends crucially on this initial clustering means. And if you are lucky, so if you use a good initialization, like shown here, so this is a data set consisting of four data points. So let me change the color again. This here is a data set consisting of four data points with feature vectors x1 being, let's say this point here, 10, 1, uh, up to the fourth data point, let's say is minus 10, minus 1. And you initialize the cluster means like this. So in the first step, you update the cluster assignments. So you, you look at the, at the half, uh, half in the midway between those two cluster means, would, let's say would be here. And then you assign all data points on the right to this cluster mean. So these all go to cluster mean two. And all these here go to cluster mean one. And then you update the, the cluster means. So here, this would be the new cluster mean would be here. And the new cluster mean for cluster two would be here. Then you update again the cluster assignments, but there's no change anymore, as you can verify easily. So you have converged already after one single iteration. So it took only one single iteration. And the clustering is quite good. So the clustering error here is, average clustering error is one, if I have calculated correctly. Uh, now, so this was the example of a good initialization when you look at the clustering error landscape. Let's now consider another example for a bad initialization. So here, in the first step, you would update the cluster assignments. So you would look at the midpoint between 
those two and everything nearer to this initial cluster mean one you would assign to cluster one and everything here nearer to cluster two I mean two goes to cluster two okay so this is the assignment update so this would be the second cluster this would be the first cluster and then you update the cluster mean which would pull the cluster mean one here and the cluster mean for the second cluster here and here for this it converged already so again only one iteration until it converged but the clustering is way worse than with the good initialization because the clustering here error here is 10 to the power of 200 instead of clustering error one okay so you see that the initialization is very important and if you hit the bad initialization you get a poor clustering so one way out and this has already been mentioned at the chat is simply run k means several times each time with a different choice for initial cluster means for example randomly choosing data points there are different strategies for this initial uh, choice of cluster means and i will not go into details of this you can read about this more in the course book or in other sources uh, important point here is just to repeat k means several times like say 10 times as a rule of thumb i don't know a general formula that uh, tells you how many times you should do it depends heavily on the data set at hand and the number of, of clusters so this is again trial and error principle it's then this initial cluster means are in some sense a hyperparameter. and if you use clustering as a pre-processing step then you get in the end you get some validation error so you can then com compare different initializations by the validation errors and pick the one pick the clustering uh, pick, pick the initial cluster means resulting in the smallest validation errors yeah very good question here uh, what if the features have different units how can we compare a distance of one meter to one euro well you you work only uh, separately in, in the features. And this might also be a reason. This might, uh, so yeah, but when you, when you compute the squared Euclidean distance, you add the feature-wise distances. So then you need to mix up different features. So for this, you, you should normalize it. So normalize the features by a reference value. For example, divide each feature value by one meter if, if this is a length and divide the feature that denote money by one euro. So you must normalize it uh, to make conceptually sense. Okay. So initialization, very important. Uh, then another parameter of K means beside the initial cluster means is the number of features. So how do you choose the number, oh, sorry, the number of clusters uh, K. We need to give the number of clusters K as an input parameter to K means. And there are different options to get uh, a good choice or a reasonable choice for K. One way is just the application dictates a good number of K when you want to uh, segment an image into a foreground and background, then K should be two. But if you know that, that there are different objects, you know that there are five different objects in an image, then you may say K equals six, one cluster for the background and five clusters that correspond to the five different objects. So from the, from the high level information about the number of objects or different categories in an image, you might know the number of, uh, the number of clusters. Another option is uh, when you when you want to use uh, k-means to compress the, the data set. Uh, we can use k-means also to compress the data set because after we have computed the clustering, we can basically throw away or forget the original data set and say, well, the data set can be summarized by consisting of two clusters and the two clusters have means cluster mean one and cluster mean two. So we, we kind of can represent or compress all the original data points into two cluster means. 
And then there's a trade-off between the number of clusters that you use. So the higher the number of clusters and the, the clustering error that you get. So the, the more clusters you use, the smaller the clustering error becomes. And often for, for many data sets or relevant data sets, the dependence of the, the clustering error on the number of, of uh, clusters looks like this. So you have a steep decrease in the beginning. You start with two clusters, three clusters, it, the clustering error goes down quickly. But then after a certain elbow point, a certain critical number of clusters, you have only a slow decrease. And then you might pick the number of clusters as this elbow, after which you don't gain that much when using more clusters uh, in terms of, of clustering error. Yeah, and trivially, as soon as the number of clusters k is equal or larger than the number of data points, you get a clustering error zero. Because when you have more clusters than data points, or at least as many clusters as data points, then you can say you, you take each data point as a separate cluster. So this is one cluster, this is one cluster, and you have four separate clusters, and the center or the mean vector of each cluster is the data point itself. And then you have, of course, trivially zero clustering error. So this, for this figure, we might have used a, a data set with m equals six data points. And then as soon as you use k equals six or anything larger, uh, the clustering error is zero. But typically, in typical applications, k will be much, much smaller than the number of data points. The number of data points might be billions and number of clusters might be two or three. However, in theory, you can use uh, k-means with k larger than the number of data points, but then the clustering error becomes zero. Okay, another option to, to choose the number of clusters is by looking at the validation error, if you have a validation error available. This is not always the case, but sometimes you might use clustering as a pre-processing step, like I mentioned before. So you have some data points representing days with some minimum daytime temperature, and maximum daytime temperature. And you could say, well, there seems to be different regions or seasons of data points, which might correspond to spring and autumn or fall. And within these subsets of data points, you can fit well a linear curve, but you cannot fit all data points well with a linear curve. So you first cluster into subsets and on each subset or each cluster, you do a separate linear regression method. And for linear regression, like we heard before, uh, we can, we do training, we fit a, a a linear curve, and then we compute the validation error on the validation set. And this validation error or average validation error over all clusters is, is a quality measure for the number of clusters. So we can then uh, do the same with three clusters and then do on each of these three clusters, fit a linear regression model and validate it. And then most likely the validation errors here will be much larger than for k equal two. So we pick the k with, which yields the smallest validation error. So there's one question, if the number of cluster is larger than uh, the number of data points, uh, what happens to the, to the clusters? There must be some cluster that are not containing any data points. Uh, yes, so this would be empty clusters. So this is a, a pathological case, but you can have a cluster with a cluster mean but uh, there's no data point assigned to the cluster. And if there's no data point assigned to the cluster, then of course the clustering error for this, for, so you could have, let's say you have, uh, uh, you have now here 10 cluster, so 10 potential clusters. So you have four clusters covering all the data points and then you could say, well, then I have here one cluster mean and here one cluster mean. So six cluster means flying around here but with no data point assigned to it. And then of course, trivially, the clustering error doesn't increase for empty clusters. Okay, 
Yes, so we can also uh, uh, obtain an empty cluster if we, for certain initialization. So again, but this is an uh, extraordinary case, uh, but this is handled in the algorithm mine presented in the course book. You don't need to worry about this in this lecture, but it might happen, yeah, that some cluster, which has some cluster mean, but which is so far away from the other cluster means and data points that no data point is assigned to it. Okay, so to sum up, to recap, k-means is an example of a hard clustering method. So it partitions a data set, which is characterized by feature vectors into k clusters or up to k clusters. So each data point is assigned to one and only one of the k clusters. In the next lecture, we will hear about soft clustering methods that assign data points to several clusters with different degrees of belonging. K means uh, is uh, a, an iterative optimization method. K means iteratively minimizes the clustering error. So it never increases the clustering error. It always decreases the clustering error. However, K means might deliver only suboptimal clustering depending on the initialization for the cluster means. So we have seen one example where a bad initialization clearly uh, results in a, in a suboptimal clustering. So here, a bad initialization would cluster the data points uh, on the same horizontal level, which is clearly not optimal because we should cluster those on the same vertical line. Okay, so one way to overcome this dependency on the, on the initial choices is to repeat k-means several times with different uh, initial, initial cluster means. And also for K means, we need to specify the number of clusters. So the number of clusters is an input parameter to the K means method. Okay, this was rather fast. So are there any questions at this point? Yes, so you are now well prepared for quiz five. I highly recommend you now to start it immediately. You have one attempt and this attempt can last up to three hours. Yes, I will try to uh, attend uh, the exercise session tomorrow in the afternoon. Are we expected to apply clustering to the project? No, you don't need to use clustering just for the sake of using it. No, it's not mandatory.